that old song, the love of God, how rich and pure. If you've got your Bible, I'm going to ask you to join me in the Gospel of John chapter 8. Does anybody here have a translation, uh, the RSV, Revised Standard Edition? That's what you carry? Anybody have that one? I don't see any hands. If you did, I would say lay it aside because it doesn't. They left this first one through eleven out. I just realized that this morning. I pulled that off the shelf and looked at it, and they just left it out. And uh, I, I'm like uh, most folks. I say it should be in there. So if you had it, I was going to say just set it down, get another one. <laughs> Join me in John chapter eight. Jesus went out, I'm in verse 1, under the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught him. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that we should be, that she should be stoned, but what sayest thou? This they said, tempting him that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down with his finger and wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin amongst you, let him first cast the stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And when they heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even under the least. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had lifted up himself, he saw none but the woman. He said unto her, Woman, where are thine accusers? Has no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Question we've been dealing with, questions and questions every Sunday, is found in verse 10. Woman, where are those or thine accusers? Has no man condemned thee? That's our question for today. Has everybody got a rock in their possession? Did Robin give, was she faithful to give you a rock? Everybody, okay, hang on to it. You're not going to need it till the very end of the service. I want, to, I want to talk to you a little bit about this little passage here today, probably in a way that you've never looked at it, because it's, I saw something here that God got a hold of my heart, and if He did it to me, maybe He'll do it for you. So stay with me, but it's a little different. The account that we're looking at is famous. Everybody, I think, is familiar with this story. The woman caught in adultery brought to Jesus. It's one of them made-for-TV stories. Intrigue, shady characters, a sex scandal, and all thrown in to make headlines and just get everybody's attention. And the way that she is brought in front of Jesus is really a stunt. Really is what it is. And they do it for they do it for ratings. Because you've got one party that's trying to embarrass another party. And that's what it's all about. But I would like for you to think for a moment that it's it's uh Characters, and I'm going to make it real simple. You have a picture of God, the devil, and humanity in the middle. And that puts all of us in the picture. So if we could just kind of stay with that, because the Pharisees and scribes are doing the work of the devil. And that's what they're up to. Jesus said so. He said, you are of your father, the devil, and his works you do. Remember that? So stay with that thought. God the devil accusing, and humanity in the middle. That's, that's why we have a story within the story. In John chapter 7, the, the chapter preceding this, we are reading of the Pharisees and the scribes' absolute hatred for Jesus. They are, can I say, hell-bent on destroying him. They are absolutely going out of every way they can to bring him down. They have a lust for power, and Jesus is a threat to them. In chapter 7, verse 1, after these things, Jesus cannot walk in Galilee because of Jew the Jews, and uh, who sought to do what? 
They are, they, they, they are trying to take him out. In verse 10 it says, he's going to go up to Jerusalem to the Feast of Tabernacles, but he can't go openly. He's going to do it secretly. Verse 20, they openly accuse him of having a devil trying to disgrace him or discredit him before the masses so that they will turn from him. In verse 30, they tried to capture him, but God stopped him because his hour was not yet come. In verse 43, there's a great division. You've got a country that's divided. Think about this. Half the country is in love with him and believes him, and the other half doesn't know what to do with him. They're not sure about this statement that he come from his father and he's going to go back to the father. In verse 44, again, they try to take him, to stone him. In verse 45, the, the, the religious authorities are absolutely furious because he has not been captured or arrested yet. And they are beside themselves. How are we going to get rid of him? And you jump into chapter 8, and they finally come to a, a plot or a plan that they think maybe we've got it, we can take him down. And that's why you have this story here. It has nothing to do with this woman so that they care about her. It is all, verse 6 says, this is an entrapment somehow to get Jesus and bring him down. So here goes the story. Jesus is at the temple, I think in the, the, uh, the court of the Gentiles, if you know how the layout was, you had the court of the men, it was right up close, and then outside of that was the court of the Jewish women, and then outside of that was the court of the Gentiles. I think that's where that happened. Jesus is teaching there, and he's having Sunday school, and uh, here these guys come, dragging this woman in, and barge right into a Sunday school class, and interrupt, and don't even care about it, and plop her down there, probably wrapped in nothing more than a blanket, and begin their accusations and demanding an answer of Jesus, saying, we caught this woman in the very act. This is no rumor. We caught her. We have witnesses. An act of breaking the seventh commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery. And then they start quoting scripture to Jesus. And you know what? That's not a, that's not a good idea to do. If you're standing on the promises and you're claiming those promises, that's different. They are accusing Jesus and they are using scripture to try to discredit him who is the scriptures. He is the living word. Verse 5, they said, you know, back in Leviticus chapter 20, Moses wrote that uh, anybody caught in adultery should be killed. So what do you say, Jesus? What, give us your opinion. How do you call it? You see, they think they've got him. If Jesus says, ah, you don't need to be worried about her. She's no threat to you. This is no big deal. Then they're going to say he's soft on crime. And uh, he's breaking the law. And he's not upholding the law of Moses. And they can discredit him that way. Or if, if he says, let her go. Or if he says, stone her. Yeah, the law of Moses needs to be upheld. Then they're going to say he's a liar. He's been preaching that he is a friend of sinners and he loves people and cares about people. And if he says stoner, then you can't believe anything he says because uh, he's going to discredit what he's been preaching. So they think they've got him. So what does Jesus do? He goes back to what he was doing. And he's doing this outline on his whiteboard or there in the sand right there teaching, and he goes right back to what he was doing, and he ignores them. You saw right there in the scripture that that just infuriates him, so they began to hound him even more. Verse 7, they continue to ask him over and over and over. They think they've got him. They think they've stumped the teacher. Until Jesus stands up and uh, says to them, okay boys, a famous line, Whichever one of you here has never ever sinned in all your life, you've never committed any, any wrong, you've never done anything bad, you are a sinless person. You just go right ahead and you start the whole process. And I think it got as quiet there as it is right here, right now. <laughs> if you've never sinned in your life, if you've never done anything wrong, 
Just go ahead. You see, uh, in Deuteronomy, which is Jesus' favorite book, in chapter 17, it says, At the mouth of two witnesses or three witnesses shall he that is worthy of death be put to death. So Jesus is saying to them, Where's your witnesses? Where are they at? They are the ones, if, this, if you're going to do this, let them be the first ones, but if they have never sinned, he adds a little bit to it, let them, let them, let them start. And you, you read with me that their conscience got the best of them, and one by one they, they uh, dropped their rocks and gave it up and left the scene because they realized that their sin was just as great as her sin. See, in the eyes of God, sin is sin, isn't it? Their hypocrisy and their pride and their arrogance at this woman is just as sinful in the eyes of God as her actions. There was a man that was using her. They didn't bring him to the scene, did they? But these guys are using her too as a means to discredit Jesus. And their sin is just as wrong as her sin. And convicted, they dropped their rocks and had to leave the scene. Jesus will turn to the woman and ask her, where are your accusers? Is there anyone left to condemn you? In the King James, I love how, it, how it's phrased, she says, no man, Lord, the NIV just says, sir, but I love the fact that she said, Lord, which makes me wonder if maybe there's, a, there's some history here. She's been to his teachings uh, in the masses, and she's heard him along the highways and the byways and seen him, and maybe there's some, some uh, uh, something here that she's in her heart that she already knows who he is, and uh, maybe been around him, and she says, Lord, I thought about that. Jesus says, is anybody here to condemn you? And she said, no. He says, well, you know what? I'm not going to throw a stone either. He could. And by law, he should. She's guilty as charged. But Jesus says, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. And he gives her grace. And he says to you, says to her, you can change your life and you need to change your life. You cannot live like this anymore. You have got to change. Something has to change in your life. If you're going to follow me, you have to change. To those men that drug her there, she was nothing more than exhibit A. She was just a means to an end. To try to discredit Jesus and to uh, destroy his name and his reputation in front of the masses, and especially right there in Jerusalem. But to Jesus, she is a person in need of grace and mercy and favor, and one who needs a second chance to start over, and he graciously points her in a new direction and says, there's a better way, there's a better life, there's a higher standard, and he gave her grace. Now, all of us, as far as I'm concerned, are like that woman. Our sins may not be her sin, but all of us, according to the Bible, have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. And all of us are standing in need of the grace of God. The devil is always accusing us to the Father. Isn't it like Jesus to say what he said to her to say to us? that he does not bring accusations and he doesn't bring condemnation when we confess our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If you've accepted Christ by faith and you've been forgiven of your sins and are born again Christian, Romans 8 says there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. Neither do I condemn thee. Which means we are accepted in the beloved. That's the kind of Savior that we serve, that we love, and we follow. Scandalous story. 
Scandalous. But you know what the most scandalous is? It's not the woman. It's the love of God. It's the love of God that can look at people fallen in sin. And God can forgive and cleanse. And you say, but, but you don't know what they've done. And you don't know where they've been. And God says, yes, I do. And the blood of Jesus is greater than all of that. For where sin did abound, grace did much more abound. So we find ourselves like the woman. There's the old devil, and there's God. What a wonderful Savior to look at us the way He does and to love us in spite of us, who sent His Son to die for our sins, that we might have life and life abundant. We're going to shift gears here and we're going to have communion. We'll pass the cup and the bread. Let me read to you the invitation. It goes out. You who are walking in fellowship with God and are in love and charity with your neighbors and do truly and earnestly repent of your sin and intend to lead a new life, follow the commandments of God and walk henceforth in His ways, draw near with faith and take this holy sacrament to your comfort and meekly make your humble confession to Almighty God. I'd like to add... If you're not a member of the church, you're, all, you're welcome to share with this. Uh, we don't have a closed table. It's an open table. You're, you're welcome. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you've committed your life to Him and are born again, you are, you are welcome to partake of communion with us. And we encourage you to do so. You're part of the family of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank You for a Savior who doesn't look at us the way the world does. You look at us with love and mercy, and you recognize our great need. And our greatest need is you. We bow before you right now, and we humbly say, Father, forgive us. We're far from perfect. But by your blood we are cleansed and we are washed and we are made more like you. So Father, we pray right now that you look within our heart, examine us, and see if there be any wicked way in us and forgive us of all unrighteousness. For we believe in you and we cling to that old rugged cross and thank you for life in Christ. Bless all who are here and all who partake. Father, may that be more real today than maybe a long time. May they recognize the love of God. In this service we pray. Amen. I'm going to ask our ushers if they would come and help us to serve this morning. Father, we pray over these elements, the bread, the juice, and our heart. We pray you bless these elements, Father, and may they become food for our soul and nourish us where we need it the most. And for all who partake, may there come life abundant. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> We've been doing this for a while and we're just about running out and we're going to go to the cup and the bread.
bread. If you're not familiar with it, there's a little thin plastic seal. You start with that. Don't pull this back. That bottom lavender colored one first. That'll create problems. I'm going to ask you to hold on to this and wait until we have all been served and then we will partake together as a church family. Don't you love Jesus? Aren't you grateful for his love today? Where would we be without the love of God? Pull back that top layer, little, I guess they call it bread. Jesus said in the upper room with his disciples, a piece of bread, he said, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's partake together. If you'd pull that back, don't pull that seal all the way off. Just pull it back far enough where it's out of the way. Kind of like that right there. Leave, the, leave that little lid there. Just pull that back far enough that it's still attached, but it's barely attached. Jesus took a cup and passed it and said, This is my blood which is shed for you of the new covenant. And they passed one cup. They all drank from that one cup. We're still drinking today in remembrance of him. Let's partake together. Now, you got your rock? <coughs> You're given two things today. You're given a rock and a communion cup. That little rock represents all the accusations and the criticisms and the sarcasm of this world. I've been a pastor long enough to know that there are a lot of good people, God's people, that live with shame, embarrassment, ridicule of their past. And some people never seem to let it go. Some people delight to just kind of Rub their nose in. And every time they see them, they want to remind them. And I look down their nose at them that, <clears throat> well, they'll never measure up or they're not good enough. And the old devil uses them to wear them down, beat them up. That's what that rock's all about, is a reminder this cup is a reminder of the grace of God. 
and the love of God and the mercy and the pardon. So I want you to take that little rock and I want you to put it down in that cup. Find a way to get it in there. And then I want you to put that seal right back down over that. I want you to squeeze it tight. Got that? Jesus said, whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Somebody here has been beat up by the devil over something in their past for too long. God forgave you. And today I want you to let it go. And if he reminds you, you just say, it's under the blood. And walk in freedom. There is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. He gives you new life, a new hope, and a better tomorrow. And when we leave, there's a trash can over here at the door. You're going to drop it all in there. Just leave it in the sanctuary and walk out set free. Can you do that? Say, God, it's yours. I'm not going to carry it. Let's pray. Father, there's somebody here that needs to let it go. And they've been beat up for too long over the past. Whether it's a divorce or some moral failure or something they're so ashamed of or something, some besetting sin that the devil just keeps beating them up over, making them feel so unworthy. Today, Lord, I pray you set them free. They will walk in freedom. They will go and sin no more and live triumphant for there is not only power to forgive, there is power to live clean. Oh God, may your love and your grace be greater that whatever condemnation they've been under, that they may walk in newness of life in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And everybody said, Amen. 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 Thank you for coming to church today. God bless you for being faithful here. Enjoy the day. Enjoy all of God's done in, in the beauty of the changing of the seasons and the warm weather and the sunshine. But enjoy the goodness of God and His forgiveness even more. I'm going to ask Nancy if you'll close, she'll close the service of prayer, then you'll all be dismissed. God bless you for coming to church today. Thank you, Father, again for this beautiful day. Thank you that we can come into your house and worship you, Lord, lift up our hearts and souls to you, Lord. I thank you for the forgiveness of sins, that you cleanse us and you make us whole, Lord. You're a almighty God. You're our God, and we love you, Lord. So be with each one, Lord, today as we go our separate ways. Watch over and keep us. Help us to remember, Lord, that you are God, and there's nothing impossible with you. And we love you, and we'll thank you forevermore. In your name I pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen.